everybody. It's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we're walking through the Bible in a year. Today we're going to cover the book of Obadiah, and this is August 28th. And it's such a short book that I am pretty confident that this is going to be a short video. Now some of you have warned me, don't ever say that because then when it's long, it's not short. And that's true, but I'm pretty confident today will be a short video. Obadiah is a minor prophet. And this is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Do you know how many chapters it is? It's just one chapter. And it's plopped right here in our chronological Bible in the midst of the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Because Obadiah evidently lived during this time period. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah. And he witnessed all of these uh, things, the, the exile that we're talking about. And he spoke directly. Uh, he was a messenger for God that spoke directly to a prophecy relating to Edom. Now, Edom is a surrounding nation. On some of the maps that I've given you, I don't think I have one for you today. It's, if you think about where Israel is, Edom is in the south, west, southeast, so kind of southeast of the Dead Sea area. Now do you remember in the book of Genesis, Jacob is the father of Israel, right? His 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, more or less, and he had a brother. Do you remember what his brother's name? His brother sold Jacob the birthright when he was hungry after coming in from hunting one day. It was Esau. Esau is the father of the Edomites, and that's why when we read in Obadiah, it talks about them being, um, does it say, oh, close relatives. Yes, they are close relatives in Israel because Jacob, his brother, was Esau. And so that's where that comes from. Petra, we've talked about Petra, is a southern city. And it was the capital of Edom for many, many years. And then in the 6th century A.D., they started calling these people Idumeans, and Herod the Great in Jesus' day was actually an Idumean. So I thought that was interesting. Now, what did Edom do during this time period? Evidently, those people participated somehow during this whole exile when Babylon was coming into Jerusalem. So let's dig a little bit and see how they were actually participating. Well, first of all, in the reading in Obadiah, we learn that they participated in the capture and the roundup, if you will, um, sort of like bounty hunters. They weren't even paid. It doesn't say anything about being paid to help Babylon, but they rounded up some of the people, wouldn't let them escape, and they were helping Babylon. And in Psalm 137, verse 7, it says, Remember what Edom did on the day Babylon the Babylonians arrived in Jerusalem. Destroy it, they yelled. Level it to the ground. So even in the Psalms, we see um, a little bit about the history of, of what was going on. In other history books, it said that Edom helped them burn the temple. It doesn't say that in our reading today, but in some of the history books, it was there. So let's look at Obadiah 1, starting with 10 to 14. This is a particular section in my Bible. And there are seven reasons, seven things that they did during the siege. Can you find them? In verse 11, it says they refused to help the Israelites. Verse 12, they gloated. They were so, oh, look at them, ah, ha, ha. They gloated when they were being carted off in exile. They spoke arrogantly in verse 12. They plundered the land of Israel. So think about, um, they probably looted and went in and stole stuff that the people had left behind. That was in verse 13. And also verse 13, it says, seizing their wealth. So they stole what they could. And in verse 14, they killed those who tried to escape and handed them over. That's the seventh one, handed them over. Notice there are seven things here, but each of them gets worse. It gets climactic at the very end as we go through verses 10 to 14. Now, there's another grouping of seven I wanted to show you. There are seven areas that Israel, in the millennial period, there are seven 
hmm, how should I say this, seven actual geographical areas that Israel is going to take back in the millennial period. Now it's interesting, in Obadiah it covers a whole lot of time period and you'd never know it if someone didn't help you understand it. In Obadiah 10, 1, verse 10 to 14, it's talking specific, specifically about this time during the exile. But in 15 to 21, it all of a sudden switches to a future time. This is starting in verse 15, the tribulation period that has not occurred yet. And then in verse 9, or let's see, it starts in verse 17. 17 to 21 is the millennial period that starts, the thousand-year reign that starts right after the day of the Lord ends. In verse 19, some of you history buffs, you will love this. It says, Israel's border in the millennium will include this area. Look at verse 19. The mountains of Edom, the Philistine plains, the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, the land of Gilead, in verse 20, the Phoenician coast as far north as Zarephath, the towns of the Negev. That's very, that's very south. And in 21, ruling over the mountains of Edom, and then there's a little summary at the end of verse 21 that's very exciting. And the Lord himself will be king. That's just a little mm, jab in there for um, kind of a hurrah for Israel, but a jab for Israel's enemies. This is interesting, and this is very uh, important because up until this time in history, and I don't really think up until our contemporary days, has Israel really occupied the whole land that God told Abraham he was giving them back in the book of Genesis. It won't be, now under David, they had the greatest expansion that they ever, ever had. But this section here is even is even greater. It, it, this section describes the intent that God had told Abraham way back in the book of Genesis. These will be Israel's borders at a future time. So here's the application for today. We mustn't stand by when our family is in need or our friends and neighbors around us. There is much hurt and much suffering around us. Can we be noticers and notice the suffering that's around us. Certainly, Edom couldn't help but notice because, I mean, this was such a huge deal. It was a toppling of a kingdom, really. But the Lord holds us responsible for how we treat other people. You know, the whole love God, love people, the two greatest commandments. The second thing we want to be uh, very aware of is that the day of the Lord is a day of havoc when God will bring retribution for the injustices against Israel. It's a future time that has not yet happened yet. One day God will set things right and he will balance the scales, so to speak, and he will usher in his kingdom, his literal kingdom on the earth. And here at the very end of Obadiah, we get to see yet another glimpse of that glory that is coming. Well, I promised you a short video today, so I'm going to go ahead and quit. Blessings to you. Thank you for staying with me and being so faithful. I can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Shalom.